ask their questions. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have our guests come up and present, and then you can take some questions. And if Russ can get a chance to throw a little legislative out there, you know, Barbara's our legislative person too. And they are full of information, but sometimes I know you guys don't like going past 12. So I'm mm -hmm. trying to roll this thing when you can get it out of here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Russ, this is Russ, you're going to introduce, and then we'll switch to the next speaker. Okay, we have someone here that's going to address the water drainage system for Detroit, and her name is Monica Lewis Patrick, and she is from We the People of Detroit. So, Ms. Lewis Patrick, thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. And, and try to get in the building and give you a stadium voice. <laughs> I have one. I have an activist voice. Okay. okay. Peace and blessings, everyone. Yes. Same to you. My name is Monica Lewis Patrick, and I have the pleasure to get up every day uh, as the CEO and president of We the People of Detroit. We the People of Detroit was birthed out of resistance to the mayoral takeover of public education. Out of that struggle, we continued to work on issues like the charter, what was happening with land and displacement, foreclosures, things of that nature. But in 2014, when there started to be massive water shutoffs across the city, and one of our colleagues and friends, Charity Hicks, was arrested for just alerting her neighbors that they were in jeopardy of having their water shut off. Uh, my grandmother has a saying that with something with irritators, she say it just sticks in my craw. Just doesn't feel good. I just don't like it. And so when we saw what had happened with charity, some questions began to come up. Why would they do this? Why would they do this? What's the intention there? And so having served, uh, I had worked for about three and a half years for Council Member Watson as a chief public policy analyst, understanding that in order to take on a fight, you must have an analysis of your enemy or at least what you're fighting against or fighting for. So in 2014, we began to have conversations with elders in the community that understood how the water department had worked when it was working at its best. We talked to city workers to ask them, what was it like? What was it looking like? What did it feel like? What was the criteria? when our water department was operating at its best. So after having those conversations, we went out and did door-to-door -door survey. We knocked on doors all across the city of Detroit. Uh, we used what is called the CASPER, which is the CDC instrument for assessing for a, a natural disaster. We had a student from UC Berkeley come in and actually adapted to assess for a man-made disaster. Now, whether we want to deal with the reality of where we are or not, there is no separation from shutting off churches from water and shutting off residents. The stormwater drainage fee issue and the residential water shutoff issues is the same issue. But the way it's being presented to you, it's just a business issue as it relates to churches. It's just about land mass and how they, everybody has to pay their fair share. And when they talk to you about residents, what's the narrative? That we just fat, happy, and lazy. That's right. mm -hmm. That we just want something for nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, what I want you to remember is that Detroit is paid for DWSD. Right. And we're still paying for DWSD. Mm -hmm. And much of the structure that has been implemented was imposed on us. We were legislated by the state of Michigan to build this system that provides water to 126 municipalities and townships. 3.8 million Michiganders drink out of our well, known as DWSD. That's right. We have subsidized the suburbs and continue to do so right. as it relates to the CO2 money. You pay 83% and the suburbs pay 17%. So even that mathematical equation alone would say it's unjust. It's not equal. It's not equitable. And then also under the Bing administration, you not only are subsidizing the suburbs, you now have lost democracy over your water system. That's right. Your water system has been democratized and he actually gave away more power to the uh, to the suburbs. So Oakland, Macomb, 
and uh, Wayne County have more jurisdictional control over your water department than you do. But you still get the bill. It's like paying for a car that you can't drive. Or living in, uh, paying for a house that you can't live in. This is what we're dealing with. So some of the issues that we wanted to bring to the forefront is we use science. Because they never count on grassroots being uh, astute enough. Having enough scholarship to do the same kind of uh, assessment and uh, evaluations that they do. So we went to U of M and we partnered with them, Michigan State. We sought out all the major universities that they would go to for these mathematical and scientific uh, 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 validation of the decisions they make. Well, what we found very quickly is that the state of Michigan can actually seize any data that you do at any state-funded university. And because we knew that there was racial targeting of communities such as Detroit and Flint, especially as it relates to controlling and having access to water, then we partnered with universities outside the state of Michigan. So we've made partnerships with Georgetown University, Stanford. We've also partnered with UC Berkeley because what we needed to do is be able to present factual and scientifically based information. That's right. So then we partnered here locally because what we knew too is there's a health impact from shutting off water. If water is sitting stagnant in your pipes, and Mr. Brown says that water, people only go on without water for 48 hours or less, well, what I can tell you from crisscrossing this city, there have been people living in their houses as much as three to four years without running water and sanitation. What we also know is that if you live on a block, and this is a national standard for health, public health, if you live on a block without running water, one household without running water, it increases the probability of a health risk to you by 100%. We've been on blocks with as many as 20 and 30 houses that doesn't have water. What we also found out from the Henry Ford Global Health Initiative research project we did with them is that in the city of Detroit, if you live on a block that does not have running water, what the probability is to you is 1.5% probability of you going to the hospital. And this is based on 37,000 cases that were cross-analyzed uh, against data that we had done on water shutoffs. And what that showed is that you have a greater probability of getting sick in the city of Detroit right. just based on the fact that water is being shut off at a massive level. Since 2014, 90,000 households have been shut off and the water department under this new jurisdiction can't tell you how many have been restored. We have had eight legal challenges to the city of Detroit to actually sue the city through a four-year process to get this information that under Mayor Young used to be openly provided to you. As a matter of fact, there was a report that used to be printed up and mailed to you. What would be the rationale for not providing you this information? Because the less that you know, the less resistance that you'll put up. What you need to remember is that if they target the churches and are successful at using the stormwater drainage fee to put our churches out of business, it creates a hole and a void in our community. But what you also must remember is that the people that live in the houses around the churches are also being targeted as well. This is a tactic and a tool of gentrification. Don't ever be deceived by that. And anyone that would tell us that there's nothing good in Detroit in the neighborhoods and all that's progressive and advancing is downtown and midtown, I would say not so. Because you are the people that maintained the city when everybody else left. You are the people that paid the taxes. That's right. You are the people that cut 20 yards. You are the people that continued to walk and monitor children going to school as buildings were shut down over and over again. There is no separation from what you're seeing in terms of the illegal and unconstitutional foreclosures in this city. What we know is from 20, 2006 to 2015, a large portion, over 70% of the housing stock in the city of Detroit was targeted with illegal assessments. What we also know is that in the last 10 years, water rates have gone up 120%. 
What we also know is that in the city of Detroit, 26% of the commerce that comes into the country comes in by way of Detroit. We sit on international waters, so there's international commerce available to us. So why they're telling us somebody turned the lights off? And why they're talking about Detroit versus everybody else? We have been the epitome of a melting pot. We have been the national example of managing the largest water system in the world at its best. And I would venture to say to you, this is another concern you need to have. If you are witnessing people in your neighborhood that are without water, you better do something. Mary Young said, if you find a good fight, get in it. If you find a good fight, nothing will run you out of this city quicker than water. If you live in a, in a house without running water for 72 hours or more, you're in jeopardy of losing custody of your children. If you're caring for an elderly or infirm person, you're in, in jeopardy of losing custody of that person. If you live in a house that does not have running water, they can actually apply eminent domain and seize your property. And then as it relates to liens, liens just in the year of 2015, forced 14,000 houses into foreclosure. So what that says is that if we don't come up with a plan that says that first of all, there must be a standard of a human right to water. Must be a standard. Two, we must demand that there would be an open exchange of information. You're paying all of these people, every one of them. And many of them are making six figures or more. <laughs> For the company that is shutting the water off, they got a $5 million contract to shut the water off when it would have only cost us $5 million to ensure that people could keep their water off. Why would they do that? <clears throat> because it is a strategy. It is a plan. See, it's a conspiracy when you can't fill in the dots. That's right. It's an allegation when you don't have facts to back it up. But when you have uh, proof, when you have facts to back it up, it's unrefutable. It's unrefutable. And so what I would challenge you to do is if your church is not talking, not just about the stormwater drainage fix, but they have to talk about the residential impacts as well. Because it's one water. Well, Even when they tell you Detroit yeah, River and they right. tell you, uh, you know, this is the Ohio River and all that, it's one water source globally connected. That's why you can have debris come from, from, uh, from Asia connected to contamination. Because the water actually uh, gravitates to its lowest point. Our water system is ran by gravity. So if you have a couple of houses on your block, then that means that water is not totally flushing that system. This is how Flint happened. How many people know that Flint actually was targeted and the reason it was poisoned was in their haste to be able to divest out of Detroit's water system to force you into bankruptcy. Say that. It's the biggest asset that we had. What did Mary Young say? Don't let them take the water. Whatever you do, Belle Isle was connected to the water. There's a major pumping station on Belle Isle. This new development going on downtown where they're going to block you off from Woodward and Jefferson adjoining is another strategy of courting off the riverfront. Everywhere across this state where water is adjacent to land or where majority black cities control their water systems, those cities were targeted by emergency management. How is it that the governor's team, his own team said that what happened in Flint was racially motivated? That it was institutional racism. How was it that those were the same players, many of them in Detroit, but Detroit's wasn't? Because a new narrative was created for Detroit. Because as Judge uh, Rhodes told us, he knew that imminent harm would be created by shutting people's water off. But it was more important to pursue the bankruptcy and to create the comeback of the 7.2 uh, miles of downtown than it was to ensure that you have access to water. And so what I would declare to all of you as Detroiters is you put the world on wheels. You were the people that made labor what it is and has been and hopefully will continue to be. You 
are the people that made the sacrifices that many of my generation still are afforded even under the conditions that we're living under now with this administration. Life is still good. Life is still good. And so what I'm hoping that Detroiters will continue to do is always look for the way to connect yourselves to what's great about Detroit. Not what this new thing is, because it's a facade. It's not real. How can we boat and fish and frolic in water downtown and then my neighbor doesn't have water? Yes. And the scripture tells us, it tells us, that when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And one of the things my mother told me as a 24-year combat veteran, she retired as a master sergeant, uh, she was a nurse for the VA for 35 years. When I first told her, I said, Mom, I can't believe that they would just cut people off from water. These are pensioners. These are single mothers with babies. And she said, honey, listen to me. See, I've been all around the world. I've been in war. Shutting off water is an act of war. Oh, wow. And she quoted the Geneva Convention to me. Shutting off water is an act of war. It's an act of war. So whether we know it or not, we're at war. We're at war. And so how do you counter this kind of war where the messaging is saying, we must do this? How do you counter it when the message is, because black folks can't lead themselves in the city of Detroit, this is why we're at this point? You counter it with some news they can use. You tell them that a water affordability plan means that every person would pay into the system what they could pay based on income. Mm -hmm. Let them know it's been done in other places. Philadelphia took our model that had been implemented actually on, under the council in 2006, and it had been written in 2005. And Philadelphia implemented that same plan last year, and we still have not been able to get any administration to agree that Detroiters deserve access to water. As it relates to stormwater, what you need to know is that billionaires and privateers of water companies got together in Charleston, South Carolina in 2005 and decided which communities that they would target with this strategy of what really equates to a tax. That's what the stormwater drainage is. It's a tax. So how can we tax folks? How can we levy to extract more from people? And there's a direct connection between the water and the school issue. Because the DeVos family actually heads up Veolia. Veolia is an international privateer of water and transportation around the globe. Veolia was a part of telling DWSD that it should privatize its internal operations. Veolia was a part of advising the city of Detroit to invest in the M1 rail. Veolia was a part of convincing Flint that it could drink from a river that if you just looked at it, you knew it wasn't fit to consume. Veolia is also a part of the privatizing of your trash with Rizzo Trash. Veolia is also a part of some of the privatizing of transportation as it relates to D, uh, DPS. Veolia also has its hands in privatizing education all across the nation. Veolia also is privatizing transportation at airports all across the nation and around the globe. So do you still think it's a conspiracy? Or just all in your mind? Or is it a well and highly orchestrated system of power? That's what it is. But what we must remind ourselves is that we have the power. We the people have the power. You have the power to utilize your vote, your voice, and your presence. If we would just show up sometimes at council meetings, if you can't speak, pray. Yeah. If you just show up sometimes at these court proceedings, because there are nine people that actually laid down in trucks, in front of trucks to stop them from shutting off thousands of Detroiters. These are white clergy. A lot of people don't even know about this case. It's been going on for three years and you've had four different judges removed off of the case to keep it from setting legal precedents that you should not shut water off. The UN said to the city of Detroit that it was inhumane for them to shut off water in this city. 
And so we've got to take a stand. And I'm hoping that you will embrace this idea that we have one water, that we are one people, and we deserve to drink from that water source. And as Mary Young said, I'm hoping that you find this a good fight. And I'm praying that you get in it. I'm Monica Lewis Patrick. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. First of all, I want you to know that Monica Lewis Patrick is not only in our neighborhood. Monica is a national and international expert. She travels all over the country, is on demand, because when you do the research and the truth speaks through your research and you can't get that truth from any other means, Monica, we the people, her organization, of which she's head of, are leading this fight. And people all over North America are asking for her expertise. So that's what you got today, okay? And I just want to add a little bit to what she said, and I'm only going to take one minute. I was a water plant operator. I worked in the water system. And I said when they started this fee called a drainage fee, this new, this new formula for a drainage fee, there was no public hearings. There was no notice. All of a sudden, people with vacant lots with no structures on them were getting water bills for vacant lots that they had just bought on the side lot program. I started getting calls from attorneys, and they were the, the charges were bogus. I have been asking the city since last September, what are these new drainage fees for? What are you going to pay for? I'm president of the We Care Neighborhood Association, Seven Mile Van Dyke area. I asked them to spend the speaker to our organization that one, wasn't a PR person, but somebody who's an expert who will explain how were the rates calculated and an expert to say, how are the how's the money going to get spent? I never got a speaker. I never got a response. Wow. And I called half a dozen times. And the person, oh, yeah, Russ, I know we owe you that information. Blah, blah. Nothing. To this day. Now, the mayor said on March 28th that we're going to build a billion-dollar retention basin to stop flooding. This was at a meeting with 200 pastors and community leaders. John, you were there. And after everybody else spoke, I said at the end, Mr. Mayor, you cannot build a retention basin for the system because Detroiters aren't the ones using the system primarily. 2.1 million people that live outside of Detroit use the Detroit wastewater system. Right here at 8 Mile and Van Dyke, you have a sewage lift station it's taking sewerage that's come as far as Oxford, Michigan, up by Lapeer County, and flown down, uh, flowed right down to 8 Mile and Van Dyke. It's transferred into the Detroit wastewater system into our interceptors. When we have flooding, it's not because of the storm drains being connected to the sanitary sewers. It's primarily because we've imported over 2 million people's wastewaters. And I have the maps of the system. You can find them. They're online. And I said, you cannot legally or morally, you cannot charge Detroiters for an improvement to a system that 2.8 million people use when we're only 700,000 of those 2.8 million people. You can't charge some for a benefit to all. That's right. And that's part of the fight. Now, as soon as I said that, and he put this proposal in writing, he's never brought it up again. I still don't know what the money's for. But I'm going to add a couple quick notes. And, you know, I, I appreciate Monica helped inspire me to look at some of these things. If you do an overlay of all the school closings in Detroit, if you do an overlay of all the water shutoffs in Detroit, if you do an overlay of all the tax foreclosures in Detroit, District 3, District 3, District 3, Northeast Detroit's getting hit the hardest on every one of them. Right. When, and I'm going to close with this. When Snyder, uh, yeah, Snyder's people said they were going to close 38 schools in the state of Michigan yes. last January. Yes. Myself and another teacher did some research on it, a teacher from Saginaw. 
First, there were hundreds of schools that were considered priority failing schools in the state of Michigan. They picked 38 off the list. Going back to the intentionality that Monica was laying out, all 38, this teacher and I researched and found, were African American majority population students. Even if they were in East Point, Kalamazoo, Saginaw, or cities we've never heard of before. But 30% of the targeted population of the entire state of Michigan, 30% of them were in Northeast Detroit, Denby High, Osborne, all three Osborne campuses, Pershing High, Fisher Upper and Lower Magnet, Law, Mason. They were wiping out public education in Northeast Detroit. So I'm going to suggest to you that there is some real leadership vacuums in District 3 and from this area that will, is keeping their mouth shut about every bit of this. And it's my intention to raise this at every level. I'm already feeling the heat from it. And guess what? They can turn up the heat as, because my voice can get louder. But they can turn up the heat because this is a fight for our life and for our community. Yes. That's right. yes. I think there's some even deeper analysis, but I'm going to stop with this time and let's do questions. Uh, what I'd like to do because of about a time, Monica, it's Monica, right? yes, sir. Monica has said she will come back. So what I would like for you guys to do is if you have any questions or any concerns from this meeting about your water, would you please write it down? We'll take, can we take one or two? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to allow at least one or two questions, but please, she's going to come back, and then we'll have more time. So I'm going to allow five people to stand and ask questions. If you've got questions, stand, please. Um, how can what? we get involved in your organization or volunteer or, or whatever? That would be wonderful. We actually do a couple of things. We do water relief, so we have a water station. Uh, that we man to actually get water out to people. We do what's called water drops, where we will physically deliver water to seniors, to persons that are infirm, or to young mothers. Uh, and then we have a third component, which is the Water Rights Hotline. That number is 1-844-42-WATER. 1-844-42-WATER. It should be on that half sheet that you have, that black half sheet. Uh, also, we would encourage people, if you want to volunteer, to man the phone lines, if you want to be a captain for your church, to set up a water station. Because what we must understand over the course of this summer, 18,000 more households are going to be shut off, which is potentially 27,000 to 30,000 people. So you may feel the impact more quickly than you even anticipated it before. And this summer is supposed to be the hottest, driest summer in decades. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the question. There's a couple of things that we can do. One is that anybody during this campaign season that comes to you soliciting your vote and they are not committed to ensure that all Detroiters have access to clean, safe, and affordable water, challenge that person as being qualified to represent you. Third, yes, ma'am. How do we stop? Oh, the basin. Well, that's going to be, have to be a challenge to the mayor. The mayor is the person that's actually initiating uh, this sort of corralling of this billion dollars that nobody knows what he's going to do with it. So what needs to happen is you've got to show up, and you've got to show up not just in numbers, but willing and committed to show up consistently. And so if, if this group would commit to at least once a month to raise these issues before city council in numbers, those are the kinds of things that will create a shift. If any of you are on social media, using your voice on social media actually pushes back the narrative because a lot of times they use media to create messaging that's not even connected to us. So you have to counter that message. If you're at a church, if you belong to a social club, any kind of group where you can gather people, a coffee club to sip in, have some of us come and do a teaching to share this information because as people's knowledge is raised, hopefully that activism will be raised. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. My name is Karen Hawkins and I'm, I was the past president of Kona Gardens Association. And as of 2012, I started going to a meeting that was entitled Citizen Detroit. 
and Citizen Detroit is started by uh, Mr. Irvin Reed, past president of Wayne State University, also Sheila Copper. And for four years, they have been conducting meetings with little dinners to let you know about what's happening in the world of politics and what they're doing to us and how we can learn to fight against it. So they told me to tell you that you elected Donald Trump. <laughs> 12,000 votes is what we lost when we didn't go to the voting booth. 12,000 votes out of Michigan, um, and I'm forgetting, um, I think it's Pennsylvania and Ohio. Those were the three states where we lost votes, 12,000 votes of people that didn't go help to elect your president. The electoral power. Well, plus, it helped that we didn't go. So I'm trying to work with them. I've been going to the meetings for four years now, and I'd like to bring that information to you. Each time we have a meeting, we have a booklet that tells us what they're doing to us and how we can fight against it. Okay, well, when you come to the July meeting, can you come and, and I will give you uh, time to be on the program and you know, talk a little bit more about it? And sure. To it? Thank you. Okay, thanks, everyone. We're going to try to do the uh, money because I know somebody wants some money. Thank you so much. Thank you, Monica. And she will be back. Okay, Peggy, are you ready? Peggy's got some money. I know you're going to be ready for that.